that bridge that bridges the gap between aspiring microbiologists seasoned professionals and the ever evolving world of microbiology this innovative initiative is designed to illuminate the pathways of success through inspiring talks delivered by accomplished microbiologists these talks carefully curated to showcase a diverse array of perspectives and experiences serve as a source of inspiration for students and educators alike whether you are a budding microbiologist eager to explore the countless opportunities the field holds or an experienced educator seeking to infuse fresh per perspectives in your curriculum microbiotalk offers a platform for shared learning and growth so whether you are a student yearning for knowledge or an educator seeking inspiration this micro bio talk invites you to be a part of this transformative journey into the captivating world of microbiology so we have been arranging such talks uh, uh, earlier also so today we have one more feather in this cap of uh, the microbio olympiad so ladies and gentlemen distinguished guests and the fellow enthusiast of the scientific exploration it is both an honor and a privilege to introduce our esteemed speaker for today's fifth microbio talk so today we have a distinguished speaker and renowned indian microbiologist dr yogesh shoche a distinguished microbiologist and director at scan research trust bengaluru with a research career spanning over 25 years his work primarily focuses on microbial ecology molecular taxonomy and microbial diversity in various environments his recent research emphasizes the role of microbial communities in the human gut and their impact on health and diseases Dr. Shoche began his scientific journey at the National Center for Cell Science, that is NCCS, in Pune, where he contributed significantly to microbial diversity, biodiversity research. He was instrumental in establishing the Microbial Culture Collection, now the National Center for Microbial Resource, which is one of the largest microbial repositories in the world. The MCC is recognized internationally and serves as an important depository for both regular and antimicrobial resistant microbes. In addition to his research, Dr. Shoche has published over 400 papers and has been actively involved in reviewing and editing for numerous prestigious journals. He is also a fellow of esteemed academies like the Indian National Science Academy and National Academy of Sciences India. After a long and successful tenure at NCCS, he joined Azim Premji University in 2022 before moving on to his current role at Scan Research Trust in 2023. In recognition of his substantial contributions in microbiology, a genus of bacteria, Shochella, has been named after him. Notably, the well-known probiotic species Bacillus clausii has been reclassified as Shochella clausii. I am pleased to invite Dr. Yogesh Shoche, a globally acclaimed microbiologist and the director of Scan Research Trust Bangalore, to begin his talk. Dr. Shoche will be sharing his insight on the topic, career and challenges in microbiome research. So I, I'm uh, I'm welcoming Dr. Shoche, and over to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So how long? What is the uh, uh, split uh, talk and the question answer? What is the split? I can. Uh... Uh, arrange accordingly. So you may talk for about an hour. Okay. We'll have 10 15 minutes question. Answer. Okay, fine. So, I mean, uh, I'll, I'll talk about for about 45 50 minutes so yes. that there is more time for question answer. Yeah. Okay. So, thank you very much. And uh, my dear friends, it's a pleasure to be uh, here today and you. talking to all of you. I'll, I'll, I'm just sharing my presentation. Uh, yeah. So, yes, I think my screen is visible now and the presentation, right? Yes, sir, it is visible. Yeah, it is visible, yeah. So, my dear friends, uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Ullas Patil and Dr. Sw Swati Peshwe for okay. giving me this opportunity. And uh, I'm very happy to talk to all of you uh, about this uh, new area of uh, microbial research that is uh, uh, emerging, which offers enormous opportunities for uh, all of us 
for research and in terms of research as well as uh, in job and uh, uh, your I mean sky is the limit so using your imagination you can look for umpteen number of opportunities in this upcoming field and this field is going to be there for uh, next two three decades so with that uh, let us go back to some of the basics so we all microbiologists here but uh, i want to emphasize the point that the not just the size but the numbers also matter so if you if we look at the cells the microbes are very small they, they are few microns in size they are very small but uh, their number is phenomenally large in the entire living world so uh, i mean if you take globally the uh, there is a huge number of uh, microbial uh, cells that are present in almost every environment so starting from the very inert objects like uh, surface of your sitting table or the air to living organisms all living organisms microbes are present everywhere and that they, they do play a very fundamental role there so some of the roles which we are very well aware of some of the roles which we are trying to learn now and here i mean it, it just says that see when we talk about our body there are in our feces we carry around 10 raised to 11 bacteria per gram of feces and 10 raised to 12 phages per gram of feces and our body contains something like 10 raised to 14 microbial cells as against 10 raised to 13 human cells so it is obvious that in our body the microbial cells outnumber human cells by one fold and it also has very important implications on function and if we talk i mean i'll revisit this point again but if we talk in terms of genetic contribution, that contribution by microbial cells is much, much, much higher. So when we talk about microorganisms, we talk about basically, as we know, we talk about bacteria, fungi, archaea, and viruses. So this is what, when we talk about microbes, we talk about that. And it also includes micro eukaryotes. So there is very little information about micro eukaryotes, but lot of, uh, I mean, research has now started on function of micro eukaryotes or unicellular organisms also. Uh, the microbiota and microbiome, the distinctions between these terms, I'm going to revisit that in a couple of minutes from now. So I'll, I'll not talk about that. So the whole idea about microbiome gained importance in uh, uh, towards the end of previous century. And the whole concept is about what is called as the plate count anomaly. And uh, uh, it, it, it implies that from any environmental sample, you plate it on a culture plate, you see maybe one colony only and here when you observe under the microscope you observe maybe 10 1000 or maybe 10000 cells per ml so this difference is called as plate count anomaly what grows on the plate is much less than what you see actually under the microscope so why 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 this is happening this question haunted scientists for ever since birth of microbiology that why there are 1000, 5000, 10,000 organisms, bacteria per ml and here on the plate you get only one. Even today we do not have answer to that question. There are only different hypotheses but uh, we, we do not have a definitive answer to this question but the question is now if they cannot grow how you can study about what they do and what they are? That was the question that haunted researchers for several years. And there were attempts to find out the answer to that. And the, for, the answer came from the pioneering work by a scientist called Carl Woods. He proposed the ribosomal RNA gene as a 
molecular clock for a different reason. He, he wanted to uh, develop a system to classify the bacteria and he was looking for a molecular clock. And he found that ribosomal RNA functions as an excellent molecular clock. So as an offshoot of this discovery, we know that uh, earlier the tree of life was divided in two branches, prokaryotes and eukaryotes, but his work led to the third branch, which is now called, we know as archaea. So that is, that is an offshoot of work, his work, but then his work led to the acceptance of ribosomal RNA gene as a molecular clock, uh, a, a molecule that gives us the information about evolution of bacteria. And since bacterial classification is phylogenetic, that is evolutionary, automatically ribosomal RNA gene became a excellent tool for studying evolution and phylogeny. And the in the reverse way, uh, taxonomy helps in identification. So a molecule that is good taxonomic tool becomes a good identification tool. So in turn, it, it, it became possible that with the help of ribosomal RNA gene sequencing, accurate and unident uh, unambiguous identification of bacteria became possible. So that's so one thing led to another. And then ribosomal RNA gene in practical terms became a powerful tool in identification of bacteria. And then that had its implications on uh, uh, understanding the why, what are those 99.99% uncultured bacteria? Because as the technologies evolve, this is the ribosomal RNA gene. It is a part of ribosome, small ribosomal subunit. It is 1500 basis long and it has extensive secondary structure. So coming back to what I was saying that um, Initially, the sequencing of ribosomal RNA was very difficult because DNA sequencing technologies were not available those days. So he did RNA sequencing, he purified RNA from the living cells and did the sequencing. But as the technology involved, there, were, there are certain landmark steps in the history of science that helped to, uh, us to reach where we are today. So the most important development, I mean, the ribosomal RNA gene, it was not a technical development, it was a philosophical development. But then the technical development in terms of technique came the discovery of polymerase chain reaction because we want to sequ sequence six days ribosomal RNA. Now, purifying RNA is tough and sequencing RNA is tough. So sequencing DNA is easy. How do you get the ribosomal RNA gene? Easiest way is to PCR amplify the gene. So the possible polymerase chain reaction helped in that. With the help of polymerase chain reaction, it became possible to PCR amplify 16S RNA gene even from a very small number of bacterial cells. Because you know, using PCR in principle, you can amplify a even a single DNA molecule. So which means that for a pure culture, even if you have only few cells and extract the DNA from that, you can still PCR amplify the 16S RNA gene and do the sequencing and identify the organism. But it also means that even if you are unable to grow the organism on the plate, you can just extract the DNA from the environment, assuming that the DNA from that organ, all the organisms present in the environmental sample has been successfully extracted the 16S RRNA gene from each and every organism will be amplified in the PCR and then after sequencing the PCR product you will come to know all the organisms that are present in the given environmental sample. So that is the basic principle of uh, uh, this technology which when discovered in 1990s was applied to a large number of ecosystems and humongous amount of information became available for each and every ecosystem which you can talk about 
normal rivers, polluted rivers, marine sediments, uh, leaf surfaces, each and everything. I mean, you think of the environment and the uh, microbial ecology of that environment was studied using 16S RNA gene sequencing. So as you understand, the key to this technology is DNA sequencing. And thus the technique also advanced with the development of sequencing technology. So earlier, in the previous century, in the 20th century, in 1990s, the available sequencing technology was time-consuming, laborious. Initial technology was very time-consuming because it involved radioactivity. Subsequently, uh, fluorescence-based uh, detection methods came and uh, the automation was possible. It became a little faster, but still it was not fast enough. But at the beginning of this century, technologies were developed, which are collectively called as next generation sequencing technologies or massively parallel sequencing technologies, which enabled us to do the sequencing in a huge quantity in a very short period of time. And that led to the development of microbiome science as we talk of it today. So just to give you an example, at the beginning of this century, a human genome, which is around 3 GB in size, the sequencing estimate for sequencing cost was 15,000 crore rupees and the time estimated was 11 years. But as the next generation sequencing technologies are massively parallel sequencing technologies develop, the cost and the time starts decreased, started decreasing dramatically. And today, the same task can be done in less than 24 hours and in less than $100. So that is the phenomenal development uh, that happened. And just to show this in another way, the sequencing cost per megabase of DNA at the beginning of this century was $5,000. Today, it is minimal. I mean, you see here, the graph has reached the bottom of the, uh, uh, the line is at the bottom of the graph. So uh, per megabyte sequence just causes very nominal amount. And the output of sequencing technologies, if you imagine today, the latest version of one of the uh, top sequencing manufacturer available, the uh, which has come today in the market, uh, recently in the, in the last month only that can you imagine the amount of uh, sequence that generates it generates 16 TB sequence in one run. So imagine the situation where we are talking about megabase and where we are talking about generating 16 TB sequence in a single run. So the cost of sequencing has come down dramatically and that's why we see a huge amount of research being done in microbiome in general and human mi microbiome in particular. So initially, the technique used, we, we are talking about 16S RNA gene sequencing. And all these high throughput sequence technologies have a small problem in the sense that the sequences that are read are short. So you get short fragments of DNA sequence typically 150 bases or 200 bases. So fortunately for 16S RNA, there are multiple hypervariable regions. So one can sequence a single hypervariable region or combination of uh, two or more hypervariable regions. So with that, the initial technology was developed. So that time there were two ways in which the microbial community structure can be studied one way going by 16S RNA gene sequencing. So you amplify the 16S RNA gene, sequence the short fragments, analyze them, I mean, uh, assemble them and find out what are different types of bacteria that are present in your sample, whether it is your gut or your skin or your nostrils, or soil or water or air, whatever you're talking about. So here you'll understand that since it is only 16S RNA, 
it will only give you taxonomic identification and it will tell you who is there. What are the type of organisms that are present? As against that, the sequence technologies don't make any difference between 16S rRNA and any other DNA. So, since we can generate as much as uh, 16 TB sequence per run, or earlier it was 3000 GB, uh, 500 GB sequence per run, and microbial genome is typically 5 to 6 MB, it was still possible to generate huge amount of sequence data and get the complete microbial genome sequences. So people also tried to do what is called a shotgun metagenomics where you are not looking a single gene, but you are looking at whole genome. So as you will appreciate, since you are looking at the whole genome, it will give you more information. It will tell you about all the genes that are present but at the same time, it is expensive and it requires a huge computational power. But still, it gives you a lot of information. So today, even the metagenome sequencing has become very cheap. And largely today, one does uh, this shotgun metagenomics analysis to understand microbiome structure. Because not only you get taxonomic profiling, but you also get functional analysis and we all know uh, uh, that the way life functions is the with this basis what is called as central dome of micro uh, molecular biology so dna is the information storage molecule but the dna functions through rna acts as a kind of mediator so information from DNA sequence gets into translated into RNA sequence and the RNA sequence gets translated into the protein. And the proteins are then the functional molecules. They act as enzymes, they act as structural proteins and they actually are the functional molecules. So why to leave behind these molecules? Why only concentrate on DNA? So people started uh, looking at RNA, they started looking at protein and they started also looking at the end products of this activity that is the metabolites that are produced. So today now we have all omics. We talk about uh, metabolomics. We talk about metaproteomics. We talk about metatranscriptomics. So a variety of omics methods are available today to study the life at molecular level. And so, uh, I mean, the, this is where the distinction comes when you talk about microbiota it is the organisms but they function through their macromolecules proteins lipids polysaccharides signaling molecules uh, toxins and other things so these are the actually functional molecules and in omics approach we not only study microbiota but we studied proteomics we studied lipidomics we studied uh, carbohydrates so all this leads to, uh, all this is called as microbiome and this is what a microbiome studies evolve. So as I said that there are variety of ways in microbiome can be studied. One is DNA based approach in that you can have either amplicon sequencing or metagenomics. You have RNA based approach where you study metatranscriptomics. You study protein based approach where you study metaproteomics or you have metabolomic based approach where you study the metabolo, which is called as metabolomics and the techniques used for everything are different. So here, these two, you, you use sequencing techniques, proteomics and metabolomics altogether different, different techniques are used. So all these, in the last few years, all these omics studies have yielded us tremendous amount of information about how the biological functions happen. So what is the kind of questions which we ask when you do a microbiome research? First obvious question is who is there? When we are talking about human body or when we are talking about agricultural soil or we are, we are talking about contaminated soil, we ask who is there? What do they do? How they respond to various perturbations and changes? Now in case of human, how can we monitor these perturbations? 
and whether these perturbations can be used for diagnostic purposes. So, I mean, these are some of the simple questions that can be asked using all these omics approaches. But depending on the question you have in mind, you can vary the approach and ask variety of different questions. And remember, just to give you an example, the kind of questions that are asked, when you say how they respond to various perturbations. So in, 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 a, in one of the scenarios, for example, if you are looking at the rivers or marine ecosystem and there is a event of contamination. So you would ask a question that how do they react to uh, presence of pollutants, which are the organisms that are involved in uh, pollutant degradation. How long after the uh, uh, pollutant arrival, the, the pollutants are degraded and the microbial community goes back to the normal. This is in case of ecosystems like water or soil or something like that. In case of human being, the questions are many related to our health. How does antibiotic affect our gut health? How does a particular food, for example, the junk food affects our gut health? How does some diseases affect our gut health? So depending on what you are interested in study, you can ask questions. And in case of human health, then can these microbial alterations be used for diagnostic purposes and also for therapeutic purposes? That question becomes very important when we are talking about human ecosystems or human body. So we also study from when we get the information about uh, how the microbial community changes under different conditions. We also know, come to know how these microbial microbes interact with each other. And obviously there are neutral interactions, there are negative interactions, and there are positive interactions in the sense that two microbes are indifferent to each other, that is neutral. The uh, uh, presence or absence of A and B does not affect each other. So this is a neutral interaction. Positive interaction means when number of A increases, number of B also increases, means there is a positive interaction with uh, them. If one increases in number, the other one also increases. Negative interaction is B is antagonistic to A. So if the number of B increases, number of A decreases. So we study all these interactions in our uh, different body parts and try to understand how these microbes are interacting with each other in our body. We also study whether our body or as I gave you example, river or soil, the temporal changes. And temporal changes could be a pollutant presence is just one example, but it could be just the seasonal change. That how does a microbial community in a river changes over the three seasons, monsoon, summer, winter. And it has many important ecological consequences. And even in a spatial scale, so in a given river, what is the microbial community in the bank? What is the microbial community at the center of the river? As the river flows across a long region, how the microbial community changes, for example, for the river Ganga, how the microbial community changes starting from the origin of Ganga, two different places, different locations in the city like Banaras and then further down when it goes to see how the microbial community changes. So there are many questions that are asked even for example, if you take the human body uh, in terms of spatial, the skin microbiome. What is the skin microbiome? Is the skin microbiome of forehead, forearm, armpits is different or the same? In the gut, you know, our gut is very long. So is the microbial community structure constant throughout the entire gut or it changes at different locations in the gut? So there are many, many such questions that are asked. And then I will now restrict myself to uh, our own body because it, it, it concerns all of us. It is a topic which is in, which is the close to heart of all of us. And it is thought as the biggest thing in biology after human genome project, which has very extraordinarily human health implications. And it is seen now. I'll, I'll, I'll give you some examples of that. And why it is important? Because it gives you safer, sustainable, and personalized therapies. So again, I'll, I'll come to this point a little later. 
what i mean uh, mean by that but it has tremendous potential for diagnostics and personalized therapies this part i have already said so i will not repeat that that the number of microbial cells in our body is uh, uh, more than actual human cells in our body and in terms of genetic material they contribute several thousand times more genetic material to our body than our own genetic material so when we talk about our body our gut harbors the largest number of bacteria and other parts nose mouth vagina skin many other parts of our body harbor microbes skin is very interesting because in terms of diversity skin is as diverse or probably more diverse than the gut but in terms of sheer number of bacteria present the gut harbors largest number of bacteria skin total number of bacteria on the skin is less than that of the gut so the it's not constant the microbiome in our body is not constant throughout the life in fact when the baby is born it is presumed that the baby is sterile so the baby in the womb is sterile and when the baby is born it gets its microbial exposure during the birth from the vagina and subsequently from the breast milk earlier the breast milk was thought to be sterile but now we know that breast milk ha harbors hundreds of different species of bacteria and these bacteria serve as a inoculum to baby's gut and not only that it is also now known that many complex polysaccharides that are present in the breast milk they serve Sorry. as a uh, kind of prebiotics that is uh, they promote the growth of good bacteria in baby's gut and uh, the microbiome structure is constant throughout the <laughs> okay yeah fine so as we grow older as we grow older the microbiome again changes and there is a lot of interest in uh, studying microbiome of elderly person uh, so what does these microbes do in our body so they perform diverse metabolic functions they modulate our physiology they modulate our physiology uh, immune response they protect intestinal integrity they also ensure body energy homeostasis they metabolize the food we eat and other xenobiotics the drugs we consume they also have uh, uh, produce neurotransmitters they also produce antimicrobial peptide to combat infections most importantly this is we know they produce vitamins and amino acids and today i mean the topic that has gained importance is the gut brain axis so they also produce lot of compounds that directly act on the brain so and thus today we believe that the gut microbiome also has a effect on our mood swings anxiety depression neurological disorders our memory our intelligence so all those these are affected by the gut microbiome so the gut brain axis is a very hot topic of research today and that leads to the concept of healthy human microbiome so what constitutes a healthy human microbiome and what kind of bacteria which you should have in your gut or any other body part for that matter to keep you healthy so that is again a topic of research that how you define as a healthy human microbiome and this healthy human microbiome varies across the globe because the microbiome is dependent on your genetics biogeography your dietary habits so it varies across the world uh, uh, from the available literature it, it is seen that the people living in different part of the world have different microbiome and when we talk about our health today we say that earlier we used to think that the determinants of the health are whole genetics and lifestyles 
But today we know that the microbiome is also a important component that determines our health. So it is believed that when we especially talking about the gut, but it is true for other body parts also that when the gut microbiome is at homeostasis, then uh, with the, I mean, the diet is an important contr uh, contributory factor. So a good diet makes a healthy microbiome and then you remain healthy. But if you alter the microbiome, make it unhealthy by unhealthy lifestyle, unhealthy diet or some genetic factors, then there is a dysbiosis and you get variety of diseases like gastrointestinal disorders, liver diseases, obesity, diabetes, cardiovascular diseases, cancer and other chronic diseases. So healthy microbiome with good food, you are healthy. Bad food, bad lifestyle, microbiome dysbiosis and it is responsible for variety of diseases. So that is what we know about microbiome today in the last two decades of study in microbiome. And this has been studied in many diseases. Uh, I have already told you uh, some examples, but it is gut brain axis, endocrine disorders, heart, lung, liver, pancreas, bone, muscle, skin, uh, reproductive organs, kidneys, bladder. So all these organs are affected by alteration of microbiome and microbiome dysbiosis results in the diseases of these organs. So a lot of information is available today uh, on all this. So typically what happens is that when you are healthy, how, do, how do the microbiome functions actually? Today we know a little more about how does the healthy microbiome functions. It typically functions by production of certain metabolites and the most important metabolites amongst these are short chain fatty acids. The production of short chain fatty acids like butyrate is indicator of good health. So a good gut microbiome produces short chain fatty acids like butyrate and you are healthy. So if when there are metabolic disorders, then all these propionate butyrate, these short chain fatty acids are not produced. Antimicrobial agents are also not produced. And then you get inflammation, increased energy uptake, increased blood glucose and metabolic endotoxemia. And this results in the disease. Not only that, the mucus layer also becomes thinner and you become prone to infections and inflammation. So uh, that is how the microbiome affects your health by production of short chain fatty acids and other compounds. Uh, some peptides like PYY and GLP-1. So this is what now we understand at the molecular level how the healthy microbiome functions. And microbiome alteration and disease has been shown in many diseases. Obesity and uh, diabetes are the diseases which concern everybody, especially uh, obesity concerns a lot in Western world for last several years. So these were the two studies that those were taken up when the microbiome and dysbiosis research started. So it was found that a microbes from obese individual will make the mice obese and microbes from lean individual will make the mice lean. And that's how it started way, uh, some 10 years back. And today we know a great deal about this, how these uh, microbes affect a correlation between gut microbiome obesity there is a loss of diversity and richness in obese individuals. Certain genera decrease, certain genera increase. And uh, what promotes the obesity is low microbial access accessible diet and uh, it increases, uh, in, uh, enriches mucus degrading bacteria. And as I said, certain uh, bacterial taxa are reduced and certain bacterial taxa are increased. This is what we know about obesity. Diabetes also is a disease which was studied again 10-12 uh, years back and it started with a very simple observations that in pregnant woman there is a condition called gestational diabetes. So a woman in the first semester is healthy, no diabetes, but some woman in the third semester 
they gain weight and they become diabetic. So, but if the microbiota from the first trimester woman is introduced in mice, the mice remain healthy. The same woman in the third trimester when she is diabetic, the microbiota is induced in uh, mice, the mice become fat and diabetic. So this was the first observation we showed the correlation between diabetes uh, and uh, gut microbiome. Today, an uh, in-depth knowledge tells us about the microbial taxa that play a role in uh, uh, development of diabetes. Certain taxa are increased, certain taxa are decreased. And we also know that uh, how these uh, Microbiome plays a role in diabetes associated neuropathies, sorry, diabetes associated uh, uh, complications like uh, retinopathy, neuropathy, macrovascular complications, nephropathy. And all these studies from human beings, those have been proven in animal models also, the role of microbes in development of these complications. So here is again, uh, I mean, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, a summary of how the microbiome alteration in type 2 diabetes is affecting our health. So uh, there is a uh, increase in certain number, a certain type of taxa, decrease in certain type of taxa. Uh, this uh, acromantia mycinophila is very important for Western population in India. We do not find much. But so uh, about the how the my, uh, altered gut microbiome in diabetes functions and affects the uh, blood sugar levels, we also know a lot of uh, about it today through the studies that, uh, that have been done over the last two decades. And what is again uh, uh, seen is that the when you have healthy epi epithelium, you have higher abundance of prevotal. I'll, I'll revisit this again. High fiber diet uh, promotes the growth of bacterium called pre genus Prevotella. There is a thicker mucus layer. There is anti-inflammatory response, trach differentiation. And when there is a diabetes, then uh, reduced, this is about type 1 diabetes, reduced mucin layer, inflammation, in decreased insulin sensitivity and autoimmunity. And uh, short chain fatty acids like butyrate play a very important role in, in this. So then uh, coming back to what we do in Indian population and uh, important to remember that we have a large diversity in biogeography. We have 10 biogeographic zones. We have tremendous dietary variation and we have tremendous genetic variation. And in terms of genetic variation, it is said that we are as diverse as entire globe. So that means that different parts of the country, not only the diet and genetics is different, but the microbiome is also likely to be different. And if we have to use successfully use microbiome based diagnostics and therapies, we should understand what is the healthy microbiome and how this microbiome is altered during dysbiosis. So we undertook these studies uh, for last two decades in uh, gut microbiome in health and disease. I just quickly tell you, we show that the gut microbial community uh, population in India is different from Western world, Africa and other Asian countries. And this difference is primarily because of higher abundance of Prevotella and Megasphera. In other part, they are present in very low number and neutral, but in Indian population, they are present in large number. In some cases, more than 60% of gut microbial population belongs to genus Prevotella. So, and it changes during diabetes. So, we also studied diabetes. I'll quickly show you about diabetes. So, in case of diabetes, uh, when we studied, we found that the Individuals which, uh, for which we carried out the study could be divided into four categories, non-diabetic, pre-diabetic, diabetics where the diabetes has been detected but treatment has not started and those which are undergoing the treatment. 
and you will find that the prevotella is high in healthy individuals as you move from pre-diabetic to diabetic the number decreases and after the treatment the number increases slightly but does not become same as that of the healthy individuals and this is also correlated the abundance of prevotella is also correlated with diabetic markers so when prevotella abundance is high the blood sugar levels are low acetylated hemoglobin is low and uh, uh, antioxidant markers are high when prevotella abundance is low the acetylated hemoglobin is higher blood sugar is higher and uh, antioxidant levels are low so this is how it has been correlated with blood biochemistry and antioxidant markers so higher abundance of prevotella is indicative of good health we also studied other diseases like chronic obstructive pulmonary disease celiac disease inflammatory bowel disease and kidney stone but i'll, I'll not talk about that but the dysbiosis indian population specific dysbiosis was observed in all these cases and in some cases like for example kidney stone we were also able to isolate probiotic bacteria that could reduce the frequency of occurrence of kidney stone in uh, people that are prone to develop kidney stone this led to the development of pan india mapping of human microbiome because the this study was done on a smaller population so here we are studying the study has been just concluded we are looking at 17 communities for four different biogeographic regions and doing in-depth microbiome studies in terms of blood chemistry, microbiome, their diet and their uh, morphological features. So the study has just been concluded. These are the participants in the study and very soon we'll come to know about healthy gut microbial population of 17 communities across four biogeographic regions in India how their diet and their lifestyle affects the gut microbiome and this will then help in the development of probiotics. So the microbiome is not restricted only to plants, uh, sorry, human beings, but what applies to human being also applies to plant. So in case of plants, the microbiome has been studied in the leaf microbiome, flower microbiome, seed microbiome has been studied and similar observations are made that the healthy microbiome is important for the plant health. The microbiome on the upper surface of leaf is different from the lower surface because the environment is different. People have also studied that the kind of using probiotics for the seeds in the sense that intro specifically introducing some bacteria on the seeds that can uh, promote the better germination and today there are publications which correlate the microbiome with some of the properties of the plant products and the best example I can give you is that one year back there was a paper published that talked about the tea flavor and uh, it showed that the flavor of the tea is dependent on the soil microbiome surrounding the tea plant. Uh, so I'm sure one can extend these studies to other plants of which are of in, importance to India and develop information on how the soil and plant microbiome is affecting the flavor of the product of interest. There have been some studies on saffron microbiome and I, I, I would hope that one day somebody takes up the studies on Alfonso microbiome also to study the correlation between soil microbiome and flavor of Alfonso mango. To the best of my knowledge, such studies have not been done. This I have already said that different parts of the tree have a different microbiome. And in general, in agriculture, India is an agricultural country. The microbiome is important in every aspect because plant for sure it is important. But what is true for human is also true for our farm animals, also cattle, because the healthy microbiome gives you healthy animals, whether for consumption or for the animal products, like for example, eggs or milk. A healthy gut microbiome of the 
milk producing animals will give you a better quality milk, uh, milk that is uh, more nutritious. The same holds true with hens. So a healthy microbiome of hen will give you nutritionally better eggs, nutritionally better fish. So it has an immense importance in agriculture also. And especially today with the, uh, there is a kind of trained against use of chemicals, fertilizers or chemical insecticide, pesticides, the use of probiotic microbiomes to increase the yield is something which is very important for agriculture. And that is something uh, uh, in which a lot of studies need to be done. Our environmental microbiome also affects your health. So there are studies on indoor microbiome. How does the indoor microbiome affects us? How does the microbiome of the pets in our house affects our health? That is again a very important uh, aspect. Urban microbiome, the role of urban environments like public transport systems, whether uh, it is suburb suburban trains in Mumbai or any other means of mass transit like metros, what role they play in the health of the population there? Not These studies are not done in India, but a lot of the studies are done in abroad as to how these public areas and public transport systems affect the microbiome of the environment and how it affects the in general the health of individual, whether they function as a means of transfer of uh, antimicrobial resistance that is also an important aspect of study. Space microbiome has taken up a lot of interest in the recent years and it is obvious uh, to say that the environment within the space shuttle, the microbiome within the space shuttle and space shuttle surface environment is important for the health of the microbiome that is on one side and on the other side it is a common sense that when somebody stays long time in the space then the unique conditions there would also affect the gut microbiome of the astronaut and it will have a detrimental effect on the health of the astronaut so a lot of studies are being done on the space microbiome especially on the uh, environment of the space microbiome and the gut microbiome of astronaut because uh, we also know um, that the gut microbiome affects the your moods, your depression and anxiety. So in the space when astronauts are isolated and if they have the feeling of depression or anxiety, then kind of probiotic treatment would help to improve their mood and injure their general health. So that's why space microbiome is also very important. So when we talk about microbiome now, today we talk about one health approach. So not only the human health, but the animals that come in contact with us, their health and their microbiome and other environment that comes in contact with us like plant or soil or air or water, the microbiome of all these is effectively going to affect the human health. So for that reason, the studies on microbiome of environment, animals is also important. And that's what we call as one health approach for the studies of microbiome. And uh, uh, it, it, it just doesn't stop at stop there. I mean, one would obviously ask a question that... Uh, it's fine. I mean, all these studies are important. They tell us this is microbiome association, but what is the use? So people are trying to use microbiome alteration as a predictive tool. The idea there is to use change in microbial signature as a tool to identify the disease before the obvious symptoms are seen. So for example, in neurological disorder, if you can capture the change in gut microbiome before the symptoms develop, then you can take precautions, you can start the treatment. In case of diabetes, if you can capture the microbiome change in pre-diabetics, pre then you can do lifestyle changes and 
either stop or delay the onset of diabetes. So this is why the microbiome has become very important as a predictive tool. And there is a role of artificial intelligence in that so because you monitor the microbiome changes over the period of time and then generate math uh, math uh, mathematical models to predict the changes and associate the changes with the diseases. So AI and ML also play a very important role. And the last thing is microbiome can also be used as a for the therapeutic purposes. So there are many ways in microbiome can be used for the therapeutic purposes. Historical and most obvious way is to use fecal microbiota transplantation. You transfer the fecal microbiota from healthy individual to a patient by simply transplanting the feces from the healthy individual. This was done very successfully for a disease called as Clostridium difficile diarrhea. Fortunately, we don't find that in India. It is more common in Western world. It is hospital acquired infection where the mortality rate was 100% because it is hospital acquired and antibiotic resistant. But when they started doing fecal microbiota transplantation from healthy individual, the mortality rate was reduced to 0%. So that means there was 100% success of the transplantation. Then it, it, it was being used for many other diseases. But since aesthetically that doesn't sound very attractive, people started developing microbial consortia from the healthy gut. Then single isolates with known or general prebiotic attributes, genetically engineered microbes to target specific disorders. And finally, the bioactive molecules from these molecules, the functional molecules. And as you can see, the specificity increases as you go for, from FMT to bioactive compounds and the ecosystem effect, that is the effect on our gut are maximum with FMT and minimal when you use bioactive compounds. So there is this gradient. And today, if you see the literature, multiple microbial origin, gut microbial origin drugs are being under different phases of clinical trials and not only for diseases like IBD, which are basically gut related diseases, CDI, which is again a gut related disease, but also for obesity and metabolic syndrome and also cancers and melanomas, you have gut microbial derived drugs available under different clinical phases in the uh, under the different uh, clinical different phases of clinical trial, which would mean the phase two, which uh, would mean that soon these molecules would be available as drugs. And that's what has led to the speculation that the uh, human microbiome market in US alone in 2029 is going to be 1,370 US million dollars. And it is in both diagnostics as well as therapeutics. So in, in both uh, uh, domains, there is going to be a tremendous potential. And if you look at the top five biotech startups in uh, uh, globally, then you will find out of these uh, five top, top uh, biotech startups, three are for human microbiome, but vast microbiome is for animal, uh, sorry, plants and anisome is for animals. So again, it emphasizes the point that it is not only just the gut, but animal and plant microbiome is also important and there is a tremendous potential for that. So with this, I'll, I'll just, uh, uh, these are all my collaborators and it's impossible for me to take name of each and everybody. And uh, I'll, I'll just quickly in uh, 30 seconds, I'll tell you about SCAN, which is a, uh, basically a research trust with the aim of transforming the future of medicines impacting millions of life. So we function from Bangalore with a currently makeshift lab at uh, St. John Research Institute, but we are going to have our own campus soon on uh, outskirts of uh, Bangalore on Kanakpura Road, 180,000 square feet campus uh, where we are going to expand in a big way. So we have multiple collaborations at national or international level, including places like Quadrum Institute of Biosciences, Sanger Center, University of Cambridge, and in India, 
uh, Indian Institute of Science, NIMANS, because we work on neurological disorders. So, I'll, I'll, I, I, but I, I did not talk about any research that is going on in this scan. We work basically on stem cells, gut microbiome, understanding the development of uh, neurological disorders and aging, and making our life in general comfortable by uh, understanding the mechanism of these diseases and aging and finding out ways to make the life more comfortable by certain interventions. So that is our basic aim of research. Thank you very much. And now I'll be very happy to answer any questions that you have. Sir, thank you very much for a very, very informative uh, lecture. Uh, sir, may I ask you a question? Sure. Uh, I was really fascinated by the uh, research that the presence of uh, Provotella uh, uh, bacteria uh, is an indication of a good health. Uh, so uh, can what can be done to improve the level of this bacteria in the gut microbiome? Uh, is it by dietary manipulation or by uh, using some nutraceuticals? See, the answer to this question is very simple. You know, uh, the simple way to have healthy microbiome is to have healthy food. So, and what is healthy food is the food that is rich in fiber. So, you consume vegetables, you consume legumes, you consume uh, uh, high fiber diet. Uh, so that is you consume bhakri and uh, roti and not uh, bread and burger. Yes. It will remain healthy. You don't even have to go for probiotics if you simply consume uh, curd and other fermented foods that are made at home. If you do that, you really don't need to go for uh, any uh, probiotics unless you uh, are taking some other drugs or antibiotics. Then uh, uh, there'll be dysbiosis and you need to take help of some dietary supplements or... Uh, uh, a probiotic treatment but, but otherwise you just continue to consume healthy diet and yes, you sir. don't worry about that yes sir thank you very much uh, the topic is open for discussion students you may shoot your questions so many interesting things I did not tell but uh, since we are talking about uh, there, there are also studies on what is called as athlete okay. microbiome where it has shown that the professional athletes have a microbiome that is different from the normal individuals and people have done FMT from athletes to increase their endurance. Okay. So the, the, the science is used by many people in many different ways. Yes, sir. Yeah, but yeah, over to audience. Yes. I'll be very happy to answer any questions directly or in, uh, indirectly related to my talk. Good afternoon, sir. This is Suchita Bharambe. Yeah. And uh, thank you for, first of all, thank you for this uh, informative le lecture. It enlightened us uh, very much. I want to ask, how does the gut microbe impact our immune system? And uh, a simple, uh, curious question I again have, is the pet microbiome negatively affect us? Okay, so uh, first question first. See, the gut, the way gut microbiome affects our health is again through variety of ways because essentially the uh, gut microbes, one side they function as antigens and modulate our immune response. And at a second uh, level, some of the products that are produced by gut microbiome, they function as immune modulators. So a lot of information is available on how this happens at the molecular level, how certain type of bacteria can induce inflammation uh, and inflammatory markers in the gut. So a detailed information is available uh, on that. And uh, about the pet microbiome, see the healthy microbiome, uh, I would say that the, the, there's an exchange of microbiome. When, when you are living with animals, there's an exchange of microbiome and it increases the diversity. So more diverse microbiome is healthy microbiome. So I would not say that the pet microbiome affects our microbiome in a negative way unless the pets are infected. 
so otherwise uh, our uh, older agricultural lifestyle when we were living with uh, all the cattle and all uh, uh, it promoted healthier microbiome because uh, it uh, interaction with other living forms the microbiome becomes diverse and in ecology diversity is important not just ecology i would say in every aspect of life diversity is important uh, and diversity adds to flavor to the life so diverse microbiome is more healthy microbiome because scientifically speaking that diversity gives functional redundancy so for some reason if one group of bacteria are depleted in your body for some reason the other group can take over that function and that's why the diversity is more important thank you sir any other question from the students i see i am not seeing anybody's face so you don't have to worry uh, uh, while asking question because uh, your faces are not really visible so even if you feel that the question is uh, uh, what should i say uh, question is funny don't worry about that That's the difference between online and personal talk. Excuse me, sir. Yeah. Hello. May yeah, I audible? Yeah. yeah, go ahead. Yes, sir. Uh, my sir, this is Vaishali Vadekar from the Institute of Science. Sir, uh, yeah. there is one question uh, that you uh, you told that the microbiome playing important role in plant growth. And yeah. the example you quoted was that uh, uh, that uh, tea plant, tea yeah. plant soil microbiome. So, sir, can we improve the uh, quality of the plant just by exchanging or introducing the new microflora at the uh, different places? Uh, can is this, there is any exp uh, experiment going on? I think Related that is the future of uh, microbiome studies and. Uh, uh, some of you sitting here can take up these studies. This paper was published only last year. Okay, So obviously, okay. this is the observation that is made that the soil microbiome affects tea flavor. So now the next obvious thing is to identify which components are the ones, which components of microbiome are responsible for developing a better flavor and then uh, develop those kind of microbial consortia for uh, uh, so as soil inoculums to get better flavor tea. So that is okay. going to be the next logical step. Okay. Thank you, sir. See, the advantage of microbiome science is that it is all evolving science. So there are lot many newer things to do. Okay. Yes. Sure. Thank you, sir. Thank you. You can also type your patients in chat box. If you don't want to speak, uh, I have opened the chat box. So feel free to write, uh, type your questions in chat box also so that uh, you have no fear of uh, speaking. Hello, sir. Yeah. My question is how good health affect our mood swing? Ah, okay. See, that is a little complicated question. Uh, see, uh, these studies, you know, when the microbiome studies go in two stages, okay? One stage is what is called as observational studies. So you do a correlation that, okay, what is the correlation between obesity and microbiome? And then you find out that, okay, in an obese person, certain type of bacteria number is increased, certain type of bacteria number is decreased. So that is the observation. Then you try to find out how that is happening at the molecular level. So in case of obesity, we have gone to the molecular level. In case of moods, it is still at the observational level. But it is it's quite obvious that uh, we know the kind of compounds that chemicals that affect our mood. For example, serotonins. So the if gut microbes produce these compounds, which from gut through the blood, they go to the brain, then they will affect the brain function and result in 
change of the mood. So that is the logic. But we do not know which bacteria produces what compound and uh, how it affects uh, our mood. That is something which we do not know, but this is the hypothesis. Mm -hmm. Okay, sir. Thank you. There is a question in uh, the chat box. Sir, can you tell me more about uh, shotgun metagenomics? Okay, I'll, I'll come to that. Before that, uh, there is a question in the chat box. Somebody has asked, uh, can we use gut microbiome to treat ment uh, mental illness? Yes. I mean, the answer is definitely yes. There are a lot of studies going on where the uh, gut microbiome alteration is being used to uh, at least reduce the severity of mental illness. We ourselves are involved in a study wherein we are trying to use gut microbiome alteration to reduce the severity of disease in uh, 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 Parkinson disease. So, yeah. Uh, and now sorry. coming back to... Come, sorry, somebody said something. I have a question. Uh, can I answer the previous question about shotgun metagenomics first? Then yes, yes, sure, sure. Yeah. So, see, the shotgun metagenomics is the one where uh, you sequence the entire uh, genome of the all the organisms present in the given sample. And it is basically, it's a simple genome sequencing. So, uh, in experimentally, the DNA is fragmented into short fragments and using the uh, NGS technology, it is sequenced. So typically like, uh, for example, Illumina, then there is a step of library prep and sequencing. So you get the sequence and you get sequencing short fragments of, depending on the chemistry you're using, but maybe 150, 200 basis fragments you get. So, and that 200 basis fragment, you generate data, something like, uh, a typical metagenome you will generate 10 GB data. So that, that 10 GB data you analyze, you try to put those 300 basis fragment together because there is an overlap. So you try to put this fragment together, make genes out of it and then assemble the genes and make the genome and then try to find out what bacteria oh, from the genome you predict the function and then it goes on. So uh, this is in brief I can tell you, but uh, explaining it in more details would take more time. So, but I hope presently it answers your question. Hello, who had asked the question? Yes, sir. I'm Deepasha Shah and I have a question about yeah. uh, how much gut microbiomes affects on uh, our mental health, like depression and anxiety or such other things. Yeah. I partially answered that question by saying that today, there are correlational studies where it has been shown that uh, there is a correlation between mood and uh, presence of certain type of higher abundance of certain type of bacteria in the gut and lower abundance of certain type of bacteria in the gut. There is a correlation. People have also tried to uh, use some known probiotics to improve the uh, moods and they have got positive results. So that much I can say. And, but this, these are the observations that are made in last few years. So as I said that uh, it's a upcoming field, developing field. So from these observations, we would go further and uh, depending on where you are at the stage of uh, your education, you could be a part of these studies in future. So if you are a PG student, you can be involved in uh, uh, such studies for your doctoral studies, depending on where you are. Thank you, sir. Yeah, about shotgun metagenomics, whosoever has asked the question, did you get the answer? Um, yes, sir. Okay, fine. Thank you. Yeah, so there is another question in the chat box, which I will not be able to uh, answer. It says the role of proteolytic fung fungi for jute rating. I think uh, uh, that is something which is uh, not my area of expertise. So uh, I won't be able to answer that question. Uh, hello, sir. Yeah. Sir, sir, how can we use gut microbiome for cancer therapy? Oh, yeah. So again, yeah. 
so there, there are many ways in which uh, gut microbiome is, uh, can be used in cancer therapy. It is used in, uh, it can be used in cancer diagnostics also. But in case of cancer therapies, again, there are, I, I had shown you in that slide also that there are some gut microbial derived compounds that are found to be having anti-cancer activities. So obviously that is a way that the, these microbes produce compounds that have anti-cancer activity. There was also a study wherein one uh, Staphylococcus was known to produce anti-cancer compound. But in that study, instead of using the compound, they actually use the compound producing bacteria for the therapy as a kind of microbial therapy and it was successful in reducing the size of the tumors. So basically I would say that the uh, there are two ways in it. In, is one is immune response and the other one is production of certain chemicals. Why I say immune response uh, uh, is because uh, I mean the production of certain, certain antimicrobial peptides because there was a uh, you all know the name of Anand Chakravarti. So several years back, he had made an observation that uh, if a kid, person with kidney tumor has kidney infection, then as long as infection is there, the tumor is controlled. The moment you cure the infection with antibiotics, the tumor grows. So that led him to believe that the bacteria present in the uh, infection are producing some compound which is inhibiting the growth of tumor and then from that bacteria they had ident identified a peptide which had anti-tumor activity. So that way the they bacteria basically they produce uh, one way is immune response modulation and second way is production of some specific molecules that would inhibit the tumor growth or kill the cancer cells. Thank you, sir. Excuse me, sir. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Shomili Shidda and I have a doubt. Yeah. So, uh, in the NGS technologies, uh, there are so many genes which are being evaluated. So, there could be unexpected results like risk factors for other diseases or unidentified variants. So, what should be done in this case? Okay, see, this question goes to different realms. It, it from uh, I believe you are talking about human genome sequencing and you are not talking about microbiome. So, when you are talking about uh, human genome sequencing, See, uh, the path from a new variants to uh, making them into specific diagnosis is very long path. So in, in, a, in a different context today, we are also currently working on some new variants in uh, neurological disorders. So we have consistently observed these variants in the certain diseased individuals. But whether they are, they are really responsible for the development of this neurological disorder or not is a long way to go. First step, find, looking at the mutational change and if it is in the protein, then you can do a, a generator computation based protein structure and see how it is affecting, affecting the function of the protein. You can start from there, but proving their actual role in the disease is a long way to go and uh, getting it accepted as a variant for that particular disease is a long way to go. It involves a lot of validation in population. Does okay, that sir. Thank question? you very much. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. So there is a question in chat box uh, about bloating. Yeah. So yeah, the uh, the bloating can be controlled by using gut micro by uh, micros because. Basically, bloating, bloating is because of the undigested food getting uh, digested in the large intestine and that produces ga gases. So obviously, by use of uh, proper uh, gut bacteria, the bloating can be controlled. 
there is, I mean, there is a question about sleep cycle and gut microbiome. Yeah. So that is a science where very little work has been done. But there are some studies about the circadian rhythm and uh, gut microbiome uh, alteration, how the gut microbiome changes during the 24-hour cycle. There are some studies on that. But, you know, the greatest limitation about uh, gut microbiome studies, which we have today is, when we talk about gut microbiome, we actually are talking about fecal microbiome and which has its own limitations. So it, it kind of, it's, it's a gross picture about the gut environment and there is too much of noise which in which we lose the real picture. So the gross information from the fecal microbiome does not give us a very clear cut picture as to what is actually happening inside the gut. So we need to develop some other technologies to uh, study the actually what is happening in the gut. But yes, there are studies in the on the circadian rhythm and the gut microbiome. Excuse me, sir. Hello. Yeah, please. Uh, sir, uh, when the normal microbiome, gut microbiome, when they become the opportunistic pathogens, so how they affect, uh, means how they can be controlled by the other organisms, suppose one one or two, they become the opportunistic pathogens, then can there is another uh, uh, um, uh, microorganism in the gut that, which can be controlled uh, their activity? Okay, uh, you are, uh, what is your background? <laughs> sorry, sir. I am from the biophysics department. Oh, you are from the uh, biophysics department. I am sorry. Then I would not <laughs> ask you the question. Because, see, it's a very simple for a micro in microbiology. It is very simple. So, there are three ways in which you can uh, reduce the number of opportunistic pathogenic bacteria. Okay. Uh, huh? One way is, first is you want to reduce the number of that particular bacterium. The way is to use some compound which is specifically targeted against that bacteria, some chemical or the phages against that bacteria. That is one way. Second way okay. is to use, alter your diet in such a way that the other healthy bacteria will start outnumbering. And third way is you just forcefully introduce the healthy gut bacteria in the gut so that the numerically this opportunist pathogen number would go down. So these are the standard approaches that we use. So alteration of diet, use of prebiotics, and use of uh, agents like phages or colicines to kill the opportunistic pathogen. Okay, thank you, sir. Yeah, so sleep cycle, I have already uh, answered. Hello, yeah. sir, am I audible? Yes, you are audible. Uh, yes, yes, sir, so, so I am uh, Dr. Neha. I am... Uh, from MIT WPU uh, uh, Pune. So uh, my the simple question is, if I am uh, if I want to work on the human microbiome, so there is a need of so much of funding, and there is issue in the sample collection also. So so can you suggest something regarding this? <laughs> For the funding question, I do not have the answer, but uh... okay. Uh, but, but you know, you see, uh, I can answer it in a different way. And this is my yes. personal feeling. See, uh, okay. uh, we, you and me cannot do anything about that, but we should promote this idea. See, problem in India is that the government funding is limited. Uh, yes. ICMR, DBD, uh, I mean, the uh, lim limited and they, they, there are a lot of problems in getting that funding. Problem in India is that mm -hmm. many industries want to make money from mm -hmm microbiome uh, research, but they do not want to invest in that. So, I mean, I, were, I was approached by many people, they want to do some uh, microbiome treatment for diabetes and obesity, this and that. But then the amount of investment uh -huh. that is required, uh -huh. they are not ready to do that. So that mindset needs to be changed. And uh, I'm very happy uh, and proud to say that SCAN is one such rare example because SCAN is not going to any government agency okay. for funding. Our chairman has is solely funding the entire research. He does not want to go for government funding because he believes that microbiome will solve a lot of health-related problems. So he wants to invest in microbiome research. I really hope that if scanning successful in next 10 years, it, that will encourage more such mm -hmm. people 
to come into the field and support microbiome research. Any other question? This is a question of probiotic intake limit. So probiotics, they come with some prescription and actually uh, I, I cannot give you details, but a couple of days I was talking to some probiotic manufacturer in a different context and they have observations that uh, uh, overconsumption of probiotic also leads to some side effects. So based on your observation, then you need to adjust the uh, dose because they had a probiotic for anti-bloating and uh, uh, she said that uh, if you uh, take two tablets a day, uh, there was uh, some problem. So then they suggested to reduce the dose to one tablet a day and that works. So over uh, consumption of probiotic also has a negative effect. Oh, somebody has made a probiotic drink in their master. Interesting. Can, you can share that information with us. Yeah, there is a question about Adverse effect of gut microbiome uh, for use of any treatment. Yeah, so adverse effect, you know, uh, when it was used as uh, a gross fecal microbiota transplantation, there were many adverse effect, uh, effects were possible because of the compounds in the fecal matter. Then they started washing the fecal matter. Uh, but then still then there, is, there are some patients about fecal microbiome. So yeah, there are, uh, I mean, uh, some People claim to have some adverse effect, and that's the reason we 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 are moving from FMT to consortia and the single proven strains. Uh, sorry to interrupt, sir, but we may have to conclude now. Fine, fine, fine. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Students definitely have number of questions, but with your permission, they are free, share... they are free to write to me on my email. Yes. Address, which yes, I show sir. in my slide. They are free yes, to write. Sir. Uh, we'll share your mail ID and sure. they can ask uh, sure. good questions. So sure. let me propose the vote of thanks now. Uh, on behalf of Government Institute of Science Chhatrapati Sambhaji Nagar and Institute of Science Mumbai, I feel honored and privileged to extend our heartfelt gratitude to Dr. Yogesh Soche for his enlightening and inspiring talk on careers and challenges in microbiome research as a part of the Microbiotox series. Dr. Shoche, your profound insight into the world of microbiome research and the career opportunities in this rapidly adv uh, advancing field have left us all motivated and eager to explore new horizons. Sir, the talk was very informative, very explanatory and very lucid. I would like to express our sincere appreciation to both the organizing institutes for their collaborative efforts in making this event a reality. I would like to thank the Honorable Directors, Professor Rajendra Satpute and Professor Srinivas Kulkarni for encouraging us to organize such scientific event. Special thanks to the Microbio Olympiad platform for providing such a unique opportunity for students and researchers alike to engage in meaningful scientific discourse. Thanks would not be enough for Professor Ullas Patil, who is instrumental behind the Microbio Olympiad, the scientific fiesta which, which is spreading its tentacles day by day. A big thank you to Mr. Bhaurao Chaushete, Director of IBS Academy Aurangabad, for generously sponsoring this event. Your technical support has been instrumental in ensuring the success of today's program. Lastly, I would like to thank all the participants, students and faculty members for their active engagement and enthusiasm throughout the session. Your presence has added great value to this uh, event. Once again, Thank you all for your contribution. We look forward to more such opportunities to learn, grow, and collaborate. Thank you. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Thank you, Irmich, and all the best to all of you. Thank you, sir. Thank you.